or joining me is uh, American Spectator contributing editor Roy, Roy Murdoch and Bonson Group founder and managing partner David Bonson. Gentlemen, thank you both indeed for being here. Let me start, David Bonson, with you, if I may. So uh, we have these very, very strong labor market numbers released Friday, the labor market continuing to add huge numbers of jobs, unemployment remaining tight. I should say, by the way, we know there are, that there are a lot of revisions in these figures, so there's always some sort of question mark about them. But I think there's no general question, no, no general debate about the fact that the labor market is, 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 is doing extraordinarily well. It's, it's very tight. Employers are reporting huge numbers of openings. Um, and yet, and that, that to the Fed seems to be a signal that they need to keep, keep the pressure on the economy, raising rates to suppress inflation. Markets, however, seem to think, kind of think the inflation battle is more or less done. What, 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 what's your take on this? So I have this nuanced view that doesn't fit cleanly into any box. I have never believed that labor and inflation are connected in a Phillips curve context. I don't believe that people having jobs is inflationary. And the fact that there is low unemployment and a great demand for workers right now does not mean that there are necessarily inflationary pressures from it. Can you explain that? We have... David, sorry, explain that, because the classic, you, you mentioned the Phillips curve, it's a classic sort of Keynesian analysis developed by, uh, you know, one of the great Keynesian economists. It, it's a very, at its heart, though there are complications, it's a very simple proposition, which is that, you know, it, which is a, it's a demand and supply relationship. When demand for labor is strong and supply is relatively tight, the price of, the price of labor, i.e. wages, go up. Uh, that seems to be where we are right now. We have a very low unemployment rate. We have d- employers desperate to hire. Why is that not inflationary? Why is that not going to push up wages? But the next level to that belief is that you get a wage price spiral, that because wages go higher, it then forces other goods prices going higher. And yet we've had disinflation and now actual little deflation in core goods for seven or eight straight months. And in fact, the level of inflation on wages has even come down. I believe it peaked about six months ago. The reality is it's mostly lower income areas that are getting needed and appreciated wages wage growth, while the fact of the matter is higher end wages are not inflating and you're seeing large uh, layoffs in some of the technology sector. Deroy Murdoch, uh, do, you, do you agree? Do you think actually we, are, you know, we can have these, uh, this, this very tight labor market, we can see wage increases and it's not going to be inflationary? I think so. I think what the focus really ought to be on the, on the part of uh, Powell Paul and Fed is not this, as David is saying, this idea of, well, people are working, so let's beat the economy down with a stick. Uh, you know, one of the infl- uh, uh, definitions of inflation is uh, too much money chasing too few goods. Well, why don't we try to have more goods? You know, we ought to be talking about economic growth and how we get the economy to perform. And as the economy grows, I think that will sap a lot of the, suck up a lot of the money that's floating around out in, in the economy. And the other thing we need is for the White House and Congress to stop this ridiculous spending and try to get a handle on that. And I think what they ought to do, at least for now, is you know, freeze the federal budget and signal the market so we're not going to keep the printing pe- uh, presses running around the clock, which we've done uh, for the last two years under Joe Biden. So, David, do you think the risk here now is that the Fed is then overdoing it? Uh, Jay Powell, again, sort of gave a pretty sort of clear indication this week that they're going continue to continue to raise rates. Uh, they've been raising rates for the last year. If you're right in that we can see these, uh, this, 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 these labor market conditions uh, as being essentially benign and not pushing up inflation, is the Fed... Is the Fed risking pushing the economy into recession? They are risking it, and I don't believe that they're going to continue tightening. I think it's possible they do a quarter point more at the next meeting, and I'm quite confident they're done after that. One of the reasons is exactly what DeRoy just said. My old friend DeRoy Murdoch nailed it. This is supply, and the Fed can't do anything about producing more goods and services. That's why the inflation's coming down. It's not merely from Fed tightening. They're helping to break housing inflation, which is good. But the fact of the matter is that we had inadequate production of goods and services coming out of COVID lockdowns. And that was never a monetary phenomenon. And so now the Fed just ends up pushing on a string. And a lot of the inflation problems solve themselves with our supply chains reopening, so forth and so on. But I think that the bigger problem has been and will be a low level of growth. Yeah. That the excessive monetary intervention, excessive fiscal spending 
puts downward pressure on growth. And that's not a 2023 story. That's a a decade and possibly two or three decades story. That's a long time. Well, I'd like to come back to that. We will come back to that at some point, but we've got to move on. David Bunsen, it was striking how the media covered uh, Ron DeSantis' response initially to the college boards, saying saying Ron DeSantis wanted to ban the teaching of black history in schools in Florida, which, of course, is absolute nonsense. He just didn't want this particular approach taken to it. Do you think this is... This is, this, is, this is a big step forward in pushing back now for the country against these, against these sort of woke educationalists? I sure do. It was really shocking to see the media actually portray it so dishonestly, wasn't it? What a total surprise. Um, I, I was disappointed, of course, in the coverage, but not surprised. And I'm incredibly pleased to see two things. Not only the outcome, as DeRoy said, it's wonderful to see a pushback on critical theory and any attempt to frame American history in the form of permanent oppression and resentment. But I also love the way Governor DeSantis handled it. It was procedural. It was professional. I think he really showed diplomatic and tactful skill. Well, give us your, 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 your seasoned investor. Give us your sense of where this is going and this pushback against these ESG protocols, these ESG uh, conventions. How, how, how are we doing? Are, are we going to actually be able to get people back to investing purely for the sake of making money? Or are we going to continue to follow these political causes? Oh, we certainly are. And I'll tell you the number one reason why is markets. Uh, Energy was the top performing sector last year. It was the only positive performing sector. And it was the top performing sector the year before. And last year, the Nasdaq and technology were down 30, 40 percent. So markets on their own have exposed the hypocrisy and virtue signaling of the ESG movement as people have been running out of these ESG uh, uh, scams like crazy. The fact of the matter is that if people freely want to invest along ideological grounds instead of investment objectives, they're free to do so. Having political pressure as to how one has to do it requires one to define their worldview. How um, Exxon is supposedly bad for the environment, but Facebook is good for governance is beyond me. The entire ESG matter is too nebulous, too pharisaical, and it plays into people's desire to feel good while doing nothing. David Bunsen, all the polling we have suggests that trust in Americans' trust in journalism, their major journalistic institutions, has collapsed in the last 10 years or so. Polling shows that a very small minority now people trust anything. Is it any wonder, really, when you see this kind of journalism and you see these kind of journalists saying, look, we don't really need to pursue objectivity anymore. We just need to, you know, we need to pursue what we think, uh, what we think matters. Oh, no, it's no wonder at all. And in fact, I'm appalled that more people trusted them to begin with. I think that there's been a long march through the institutions that have done a war on objectivity and a war on moral clarity. They're not opposed to objectivity because they want moral clarity. They're opposed to moral clarity, too. And this all goes together. They're trying to impose their version of morality, their version of political truth, and they're doing so in the most abjectly dishonest way possible. And it's at coming at a time where trust in institutions at large yeah. is at an all-time low, and that is not healthy for our society.